So it's, uh, it's the honor of the president to uh, put together and shape a uh, topic for a presidential symposium every year. And this year I chose to focus on recent understandings and advances in human origins uh, with particular focus on Africa. And after deciding on this topic, the name that immediately came to mind uh, for leading this symposium was Dr. John Hawkes of the University of Wisconsin. Dr. Hawkes' work in genetics and skeletal biology of fossils has taken him across continents to investigate adaptation and relations in ancient environments. His breadth of knowledge in the population dynamics and natural selection is vast and deep. And his re recent efforts characterizing Homo naledi is uh, just personally really fascinating. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to uh, meet Dr. Hawks in person, I hope you do in uh, coming days. He's just delightful. Um, <clears throat> I've also asked uh, Charles Rotimi and Sarah Tishkoff, who have uh, impressive knowledge in, this, in the area of African genetics, to act as moderators. And Dr. Hawks will introduce uh, Drs. Sudyal and um, Wonkum to uh, discuss their research about uh, African um, population genetics and medical genetics and ancient DNAs. So without further ado, can I turn it over to John Hawks and look forward to your remarks. Thank you. Thank you, David. I, I so much appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to this amazing audience about our origins as a species. Um, to have the organization give a platform to talk about evolution and the centrality of Africa in our origins is just amazing. To help me with this, I have Himla Sudyal, a professor at the University of Witwatersrand, whose expertise in population genetics and variation in southern Africa is almost unmatched and Ambrose Wonkum, who is from the University of Cape Town, whose knowledge of disease genetics and the importance of African variation in understanding disease and clinical applications is just you know, a wonderful translational way of showing the way that our variation as a species is, is centered in the way that we as geneticists and as evolutionary biologists think about how we are as a species. And so, I want to take you briefly with me back five years ago from right now when I was learning for the first time about a place called the Rising Star Cave. It's beneath this hillside that you see here and I was getting videos from my friend Lee Berger. This is Stephen Tucker who is one of the two people who was the first in the chamber that I'm going to describe to you in some detail. You see this passageway that he's going down. It's a, it's a 40 foot vertical climb with a seven and a half inch width and he and Rick Hunter were the first people to see these fossils. Now the Rising Star Cave system has two kilometers of underground passageways. It's, it's not impressive in caving terms, but for me as a non-caver, it's really intimidating. And this little cutaway shows you some of the key elements, these narrow passages, one called the Superman's Crawl that's ten and a half inches high that you have to crawl through this way like Superman in order to get through to the other side of it. And a vertical passageway that we call the chute, 40 feet and a seven and a half inch width. That's what Stephen went through through and brought back these photographs. Photographs of a hominin skull embedded in the sediment in the floor of this chamber. A photograph of a mandible, a hominin mandible, something related to us. When I saw these pictures, when Lee Berger, my friend, saw these pictures, he said, look, we've got to organize an expedition to go there and to see what these fossils are. But none of us would fit in this chamber. <laughs> And I'm not ashamed to say it, right? I mean, it's not like there's a large fraction of humanity that have the skill set necessary to do this work. And Lee recruited six amazing excavators, all PhD students in archaeology, who in 2013, five years ago, assembled and began to excavate in this remarkable cave system. And you see here just a little fraction of the work that they did, over 28 days underground. And then in another series of field expeditions, our team recovered one of the largest assemblages of hominin fossils ever discovered, the largest ever discovered in Africa. 
And it was big news, and it was wonderful, but it raised incredible mysteries. And in the context of talking about human variation in Africa, I want to talk about why this is exciting right now. It's exciting because new data sets are coming online that have raised questions that we never asked before. New data sets from the fossil record, and you're going to hear about recent new data sets from the genetics that combined to give us a perspective on the origins of our species that's something that is new, something that we hadn't thought of before. So some background on myself. I was a student 20 years ago and I learned to study fossils and I studied skeletons and I studied Neanderthals. You see me here working in the field. But I've got to tell you that Neanderthals were not, did not at that time seem like a growth industry. And the reason is that fossils are among the rarest things on the planet. And it was very obvious that if you didn't find fossils, you weren't going to be in a position to really say novel things about them. And so I did what any one of you probably would have done. I went into genetics. And I wrote about human variation. I wrote about what we could understand about the fossil, about the fossil record by taking genetic variation into account. This was a time when, of course, the Human Genome Project was happening. Later, the HapMap and other sources of information about variation made it possible to look at evolutionary dynamics. We studied natural selection. We were among the first to say that, hey, there could be genetic introgression from these archaic hominins, and here's how we might look for it. So, so that was amazing. And when actually ancient DNA evidence from the Neanderthals and later from the Denisovans was, was sequenced, it became clear that this was an amazing source of information, not only about human history and evolution, but also about human biology. For the first time, we realized Darwin's original insight that if you understood how things were related to each other, you could figure out how they worked. And Neanderthal genetics has, as many of you know, become an enormous area of research, not only to understand how Neanderthals are connected to us, but principally to understand how it is that we've come to be the organisms that we are. How is it that we vary and what variations have that evolutionary time scale associated with them? Now, with that explosion of cleverness and amazing things that you were seeing happen, you know, I. I was a fairly clever person, but it's very hard to compete with postdocs around the world who are eager to come up with new ways to analyze Neanderthal genome sequences. I decided it was easier to go back in the field and find fossils. <laughs> and that's precisely what I've been doing. Um, and with some enormous success. But as a scientist who covers these two spheres of interaction, right, these two spheres of science, the fossil record and the genetic record, I have a unique insight and I try to share how these things are coming together and how the fossil record is still informing us about things that we didn't really expect. The human fossil record is one of the largest fossil records of any large vertebrate, certainly. And, you know, if we're not talking about microforamina or something, it's one of the best documented fossil records in the world. But there are sparse areas of it. And so I'm going to give you a bit of a deep time perspective. I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to say, what are human origins like from the beginning? Our closest living relatives are the chimpanzees, bonobos, and gorillas. And genetics and a little bit of fossil record helps to inform us that our common ancestors with chimpanzees and bonobos last lived between around 5 million and 10 million years ago. The gorillas are our next closest relatives. Their separation from the human chimpanzee branch occurred a little bit earlier, between 7 and 12 million years ago. So that's the time frame that we're talking about. Something like 300,000 human generations is as long as our lineage, which we call the hominins, has existed. Up until the last two million years, our lineage was exclusively African. The first third of that time, from seven million years ago up to four million years ago, we know relatively little. We have a couple of species from different parts of Africa, Sahelanthropus, Ardipithecus. These species tell us that our earliest relatives and ancestors were making the first foray into a more upright posture. They weren't fully bipedal yet, but they were, they were changing in the direction that we are by becoming a little bit more committed to upright posture. After four million years ago, we know quite a lot. We've got a big fossil record of a group of organisms that we call the Australopiths. 
Australopithecus was a genus that's been found in East Africa, it's been found in South Africa. Australopithecus afarensis, the famous species that the Lucy skeleton belongs to, you see here, here, second from the left, is represented by hundreds of fossils. Australopithecus africanus from South Africa, also represented by hundreds and hundreds of fossils. We have other species of Australopiths that show a substantial diversity. They show some species that were having much larger teeth and committed to chewing hard objects. They show other species that were, that were pursuing a more specialized diet that was, that was a little bit more focused on, on woodland things, the things that maybe our relatives among the apes would have focused on. So that early phase of our evolution consisted of diversity. There were lots of different species of these things, but they all shared some characteristics. They were small compared to us, small in body. They were small in brain compared to us, with brains about a third the size of our brains. They had teeth that were actually bigger than ours, which is an innovation because gorillas and chimpanzees relative to their body size have smaller teeth than ours. They had small canine teeth, and that suggests something about their social dynamics, about their communication socially. And finally, we believe, like chimpanzees and gorillas, they were able to make and use tools, the earliest stone tools in the fossil record now, around 3.5 million years old, attributable to one of these species. Now, after two and a half million years ago, things get really complicated because there's greater diversity, and that diversity includes not only these robust species committed to large chewing, but also our relatives, the genus Homo. Initially, species like Homo habilis had slightly larger brains than any Australopith did, and they seemed to place us onto a pathway of larger brain size as a strategy. After 1.8 million years ago, we find the first evidence of hominins, our relatives, outside of Africa in the form of this species, Homo erectus, this skeleton from Dimenisi in the Republic of Georgia. Homo erectus was human-like in body size and human-like in body shape. Its proportions were like ours. Its brains were a bit smaller than ours are, but around 50, around 30 percent smaller. So they were substantially larger than any of the Australopiths. We've traditionally thought of this species as being sort of the first step along the pathway to really becoming human. It's human-like in body shape and body size. And it's the first colonizing species. It's the first species to leave Africa. Its relatives and descendants might still have been there even very recently. This skeleton from the island of Flores, Homo floresiensis, that species persisted until around 65,000 years ago when modern humans probably showed up in this part of the world. And so that diversity from that early migration from Africa probably remained for some time. So we're looking at a bushy tree, a lot of species. And when we look at the later phases of that tree, we see that the diversity was still not a linear pathway, not one species evolving into another without diversity, but branching and branching into a diverse array of species. Now, lately, the Neanderthals have gotten a lot of press. This site, Kropina in Croatia, one of the largest Neanderthal assemblages, they've always gotten a lot of press, and I love them. But they've gotten a lot of press because there's a lot of them, because Europeans have been going into caves and, more recently, other parts of the field for 150 years and finding these bones. We know a lot about Neanderthals. We know very little about another branch called the Denisovans, but the reason why that they actually come literally from this one phalanx, this one bone of a pinky from Siberia, but the reason why they've become so important recently is because of genetics, because of their genomes. We know something about their entire genome relative to human genomes, and that gives us an avenue of looking back at the past that's very dense. It shows us, for example, that these archaic humans that separated from our African ancestors something like 600,000 years ago, nonetheless were interbreeding with them occasionally. And when modern humans, as we consider our ancestors that emerged from Africa within the last 100,000 years, encountered them, they mixed to a degree, right? This is a story that's been told many times. It's a story that involves a bottleneck where you see here all African population samples from France, from China, from New Guinea, from North and South America, 
all of them have this pathway around 50,000 to 100,000 years ago when they were very, very small in size. And that means that they've emerged from a common ancestral small population. But that's not true for many African populations. African populations you see here, and, and Himmler will talk about these in some detail, don't undergo the same bottleneck pattern. I want to talk for a moment about recentering Africa. And I'm going to talk about African variation. I'm going to talk about the fossil record in Africa. But I want to alert you that this story of African origins, which has centered Africa in our origin as a species, has often, termed, has often served to decenter Africa as a role of variation that remains important up till today. When you hear about out of Africa, what you're hearing about is the triumph of people who left. And in fact, the main stage of our evolution remained Africa during all these times. Think of the Neanderthals, right? Who diverged from our African ancestors something like 600,000 years ago. That's not 1.8 million years ago. The Neanderthals had a nexus of evolution that was African. The Denisovans came from this African origin. Our modern human relatives came from this African origin, and Africans have always been this diverse throughout. I want to talk about the African record, right? Because as my role in this symposium talking about where fossils and archaeology are taking us, I want to leave you with three big messages. The first message that we can say about African origins is that modern humans, our species as we understand it today, originated not suddenly in a bottleneck 100,000 years ago, but over a long period of time. Now we understand up to 250,000 years or more before those key events of the last 100,000 years. When we first realized that humans had originated in Africa, people began looking at the African fossil record and saying, who are they? Who are these people? They looked at skulls from different parts of the continent that had higher foreheads, that had reduced brow ridges, that had smaller faces, and they found them in the period between 130,000 and 60,000 years ago, here from Singa in Sudan, from Laitoli in Tanzania. And fossil analysts pushed this further back. They found new ways to date original fossils from the 1960s and 70s, like the Omo fossils, which we now understand are 195,000 years old. They found new fossil remains, like the Herto fossils from Ethiopia at the bottom, 165,000 years old. So they were finding what they said were the first modern humans. But we today realize that those first modern humans were not the first humans to be on the line of modernity. We have new dates for sites like Jebel Erhud in Morocco, more than, two, than 250,000, up to 350,000 years ago. From Florespad in South Africa, 250,000 years ago. So you have these fossils that are showing transitions to modernity that go back well into the Middle Pleistocene. African fossils in archaeology both show that there were deep, long-lasting diversity across that entire time span. I want to show you just a chart, and I want to tell you very quickly, when you look at the diversity of those skulls that I just showed you, what you find is that they are more diverse as a collection than the Neanderthals are, even though they cover a similar time range. They're more diverse than any modern human population are they're recording a diversity that no longer exists in the world now. That African origin included things that aren't right now here. When we look at archaeology, the archaeology that we associate with these populations is called the Middle Stone Age. And the Middle Stone Age is a time when people began to use bone tools and points. They began to use pigment and inscribed pigment with regular patterns. They made blades and points that they hafted onto spears. And when you look at these Middle Stone Age assemblages, this from Katupan in South Africa, more than 350,000 years old, you're looking at the tools that were potentially made by these early transitions to our species. Pigments from Olograsile in Kenya, more than 250,000 years old. These people are marking themselves, they're marking objects, they're using pigments. But those archaeological traditions are diverse, and different parts of Africa show different aspects of that diversity. 
So those diverse lineages existed, they coexisted with each other, they lived in different ecologies potentially, and they mark a diversity that no longer survives. And finally, the third point, populations with very ancient roots survived until very recently. And we don't know how they interacted, we don't know how they contributed to us. This skull from Nigeria, Iwo Eleru, we used to think of it as possibly representing an early modern human, one of the earliest. Radiocarbon and other dating methods now show it's less than 20,000 years old. It represents an ancient lineage whose diversity is no longer here in the same way. And that brings us back to Homo naledi. When we uncovered these fossils, we didn't know what to make of them. They were very primitive in many ways. They had hands that had a combination of very curved fingers and yet some very human-like aspects to them. They had feet that were very human-like, but their shoulders were canted upwards and, and looked like they were well made for climbing. Their skulls looked in some respects like Homo erectus skulls, but their brains were very small. Very small, a third the size of ours, like the earliest hominins. After that first discovery, we, our team went back to the cave and they found a second chamber, a second chamber with the skeleton of yet another Naledi individual. We call him the Neo skeleton. And he shows us a completeness that we can reconstruct this species and say, this is very different from humans. This is not something that, that it looks like something that should be two million years old. We have at least 15 individuals of all ages, so we know quite a lot about this sample. It's not just a one-off, but when we analyzed the sediments from this cave and the flowstones in the cave, we found that this species is between 236,000 and 335,000 years old. It lived in the same time frame as our modern human ancestors were originating. It was there. We don't know how they interacted, we don't know how they lived together, whether they encountered each other, whether they interbred. A lot of you are gonna ask, do we have DNA? It's in the time range when we might, but so far our efforts to recover DNA have failed. Homo naledi tells us that our origins were more complex than we knew. Our team is going back to the field. Here you see Becca Peixado. We've recently recovered an infant skeleton that we've brought out of the cave. Our team is diversified. We have new people who are going out with us. We're showing the fossils in public. You see them here on public display. If you guys are in South Africa, you can see these. Um, it's an amazing, amazing experience. But the key thing that I wanna emphasize is as we continue to investigate this, the mysteries about our origins, the ones that really stick with me, are African mysteries. We don't know how our species began. We've got hints of it, but we need more evidence. And that evidence, the primary record, we've magnified the fossil record enormously by our investigations in South Africa, but we need more. We need more exploration because we're putting pinpoints onto a map. Our team is back underground later this month with new excavators, and we'll see what is there underground. Uh, Lee and I, still working to try to find new sites that will represent our African origins. It's an exciting time, a time when we're uncovering things that we never imagined would have been there. And it's complexifying our view of human origins. It's exciting. It's amazing that we're in a time of transformation. And we're hoping that as the genetics progresses and as we're able to recover more fossils, that we will discover more and more about this shared origin that all of us have, recentering Africa in the story of our origins. All right, thank you everybody. I have time for just a few questions before we go to the next speaker. If you wanna ask a question, you could just hop up to the microphone. Yes. Hi. Thank you, Hila from Colombia. Is this tree like something that you see in other species or it's specific to humans? 
what an outstanding question. Is this tree like something that you see in other species? What we're learning, and humans lead the way, right? You as human geneticists are leading the way in understanding diversity in, in a natural population, which is ours. But other geneticists who are working on extinct species, ancient DNA, and also living species are finding that this tree is not at all unusual. When we look at elephants, when we look at wolves, when we look at chimpanzees, when we look at bears, you see this again and again, this diversification over millions and in some cases hundreds of thousands of years with some interbreeding between these different branches. It turns out that humans are pretty typical. We operate in the way that other species do, but that's a picture that 20 years ago we were not going to the fossil record thinking about. It's changed the way that we think about the importance of diversity and the way that we think about the, the importance of these ancient lineages. Okay, number five. Uh, f fascinating story, absolutely, uh, and, and you're, you're completely reshaping my, my view of sort of the African continent, and my question from there is, if you look at the modern humans that live in Africa, can you sort of tell something about the diversity of contributors, of genetic contributors, mm -hmm. to modern Africa, many of which probably never made it to the out-of-Africa humans? I'm just curious if the genetics in the same way that we can observe gene flow going across all these crazy ways for all the humans who've, le who've left. What about the humans who stayed? Are there genetic contributions from some of the fossils that you showed or? Are there genetic contributions from some of those fossils or potentially other populations? Exactly. There are hints that there are. Now we don't have the smoking gun, right? We don't have the DNA from these very ancient specimens. But what we do have, because of the Neanderthal genome, because of the Denisovan genome, is an idea of what the signature of this ancient integration looks like. And there are hints that African populations today do carry signatures of integration from unknown sources. If that's true, it may be from populations like this, or from populations like the Iwolero school, which survived until quite recently. It may be from something like Homo naledi. We don't know, and I wouldn't presuppose. Uh, the thing is that what we have to discover, I think, is going to surprise all of us. The other question that I have is about how, how recent these events are. It's 20,000 years. So my question is about the folklore of the ages of the heroes and the stuff that we read about in Greek mythology. Could any of that have to bear with populations that people saw the skulls of or the remains of or, you know? <laughs> Things like that. It is, it is a fascinating question, and I will leave it to the imagination, right? Because, <laughs> because the fact is that you wonder, you know, is this something that's, that, that history might, might have traces of? And I can't say that, you know, that, that we can test that hypothesis in a scientific way, but at the same time, I've been surprised a lot of times in the last five years. And if we're surprised again, I've sort of lost my capacity for cynicism about surprises. <laughs>